Okay, welcome to another video about Stoicism. I, uh, fun fact, I record these on a Microsoft Surface and um, cameras all over the world of Microsoft Surfaces have stopped working. Apparently I could make it work, but it's really weird. All over the world. Microsoft, what have ye done? Now, we're going over the moral letters of Lucius Aeneas Seneca and uh, we landed on letter 84. And I, I was made to think of something as I was reading this letter. It's fairly short. I will read you uh, the first paragraph. From Seneca to Lucilius, greetings. Those trips are shaking the laziness out of me. They've been beneficial, I believe, both to my health and to my studies. Why they should improve my health is plain to you, since my love of literature makes me lazy and neglectful of my body. I get some exercise through the labor of others. Why they should aid my study, I will explain. I have withdrawn from readings. To be sure, reading is necessary. First, that I may not be wrapped up in myself alone, and second, that after finding out about the inquiries of others, I may judge concerning their... Sorry, I may judge concerning their discoveries and ponder what remains to be discovered. Reading nourishes one's talent and refreshes it when it is worn out with study, even though reading itself requires study. We ought neither to write exclusively nor read exclusively. The first writing, that is, will deaden and exhaust our powers. The second will weaken and dilute them. One must do both by turns, tempering one with the other, so that whatever is collected through reading may be assimilated into the body by writing. Okay, now, I'm going to go off on what might well be a bit of a tangent here, but uh, I, I find myself in a profession where I, I have to do both. I have to both read and write because I, I teach, right? I, I teach psychology at a polytechnic. So, this appealed to me because it made me think about something that I often think about. And that is what is an expert, and I and I and I, I want to I really want to try to to connect this to Stoicism as well, because Stoics actually have an answer. A lot of people who find themselves in all sorts of jobs, I have found, and I've had discussions with a lot of people, uh, find themselves to have something that we call imposter syndrome. Right, you you. You feel that you got the job and that, that really you're, you're not really suited for that job or that you're really not qualified for that job, I should say. That you, you just don't really um, have the, the, the necessary qualifications to um, actually do that thing. And I find that interesting because I think everybody suffers from that uh, at, at some point or another. But then the question that arises to me is, but then at what point are you an expert? I've had um, conversations about this with, with people who work in academia who, who often feel this way. And it's strange because people who work in academia typically are the most qualified people in the world. I mean, when, when, when you think about it, um, for example, in my case, bachelor of, bachelor of Science in Psychology, three years, Master of Science, two years, PhD, five to infinity years, postdoctoral work, that was not so, I mean, it, it, it adds up, you have an insane amount of training, and yet those people who are trained most, then often have moments where they feel very unqualified, and I think the reason for that is that the more you know, the more you know that you know very little and that you may be very specialized but that there are a lot of uncertainties. People who don't have a lot of training believe they know everything and believe that they are experts at everything. We see this a lot online <clears throat> and we've seen a lot of that in the past couple of years. People who have basically no training in any field believe they know better than full professors in those fields because these people happen to watch a video of something online and therefore they're experts. So then what is an expert? And how can you tie that in to a philosophy like Stoicism? Well, 
I think a lot of people who are so insecure about their actual knowledge are those people who really have all the necessary knowledge. But they sometimes forget, or maybe I should say, they sometimes misdefine what it means to be an expert. I'll, I'll bring this back to, to myself, if you forgive me for, for using that, but, but I think that's, that's a clear example. I am a psychologist. But, but I'm not that type of psychologist. I'm not a therapist. I don't, I don't talk to people. I don't give therapy. I'm not even qualified to do that or authorized to do that. I'm, I'm, my, my field is, is cognitive psychology. I study thought processes in the brain and that sort of stuff. So I know that even within my field, right, the field of psychology, I have a very limited knowledge of one specific subfield of psychology. And about that field, I know quite a lot. But does that then make me an expert? Or if you want to take something more innocent, I, I like fountain pens and I've, I've used fountain pens for a long time. But I don't believe I've ever described myself as, but I am a fountain pen expert. Because I, I feel uncomfortable doing that. There are people out there who know a lot more about than me about that specific topic. People who've done fountain pen repair for, for decades or something. They, they, they know more about that topic than I do. So again, then what really is an expert? And I think here the Stoics are very clear. Because the Stoics continuously emphasize, okay, well, when you look at our school of philosophy, there is an expert. They would call that the sage, right? The, the, the wise person. And they, they typically take someone like Socrates as an example. Say, so, well, that, that is a wise person. That is a sage. And you should emulate the sage because that's an expert. The expert is wise. So if you, if you find yourself stuck somewhere, you don't know what to do, then think about what, what would a sage do? What would Socrates do in this situation? And then when, 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 when you figure that out, then you do that thing. And that's the right thing to do. That's the virtuous thing to do. But the Stoics, I think very interestingly and differently from some other schools of thought, they did not go on to describe themselves as experts. The Stoics, think of the, 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 the big Roman Stoics, Seneca, Epictetus, Marcus Aurelius. None of those people said, I'm an expert. I, I am a Stoic sage. I, you, should, you should emulate everything I do. And um, in other schools, Hellenistic schools of philosophy, that was not the case. Take the Epicureans. Epicurus kind of modeled himself as a sage. And his, his students had to do all sorts of things, like, like memorize his birthday and that sort of thing, because he was, he was the, the, the impressive expert, the sage. And all the Stoics, at one point or another, emphasize that they're not a sage. Epictetus does that quite a lot in his writings. In the, well, his, I mean, he didn't really write them himself, but in the lectures he, he taught that were recorded by someone else, he regularly emphasizes, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a sage, right? I'm, I'm not a sage. And there was even a very good, dis, uh, sorry, one of his, um, um, in one of his lectures, uh, he actually is asked something by his students like that. Like, are you, are you a sage? And his answer is fascinating because he goes vehemently against that. No, I'm not. No, I'm definitely not. Okay, and then let me get, I'm sorry this was so long, but let me get to the point. Then what? And this, I think, is where the Stoics do something beautiful. They say, but, but here's the thing. Nobody is a sage. Socrates was, but he's dead. None of us are ever going to be sages. None of us will ever be experts. But we make progress by working diligently. We make progress. And progress is enough. So if you continue to apply yourself to learning, to studying, to reading, but also to practicing, Seneca here calls that writing, but to the actual practice of what you have read. Apply yourself to it. 
Keep doing what you are doing. Keep practicing stoic fundamentals or fundamentals in anything. It doesn't matter. In my case, it's psychology. I continuously have to learn more about psychology and cognitive neuroscience and statistics and all these things that I teach, right? I'm still not sure I'm an expert. There, 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 there is the PhD and that's great, but I mean that I, I, I don't necessarily feel like an expert. But I've made progress. I'm a lot more of an expert than I was 10 years ago, five years ago, two years ago, because I continue to grow, because I continue to apply myself to that specific discipline. And as a result, I continue to make progress. Every day I'm a little bit better than the day before, whether that is in a professional sense or whether that is in the sense of my study of stoicism and trying to apply that to my life. And there are hard days and there are easier days, but overall, there's an upward trend. I make progress. Progress is enough. So that, I find, is a very constructive way to look at specifics. Look at the idea of expertise. Look at yourself. I'm not just talking about academic sense, whatever. I'm, I'm talking about in general, the way you approach life. None of us will truly be experts. And I'm very wary of people who refer to themselves as experts on something. Because there's always more to learn. And there certainly is always someone who knows more about that topic than you do. But you can make progress. And being a progressor, someone who continuously progresses... That's where, it, where it's at. And that's where you should be every day a little better. Well, that's it. I hope this was useful. Um, let me know what you think about experts, expertise, progress, this sort of stuff. Thank you for watching. And I'd gladly see you again next week for more talk about stoicism. Bye.